to support these early and mid-career African slams. True, as we've been hearing, there is some optimism now, as it seems everyone is so conscious and of this gap that is existing. Case number three, I will... Yeah, the EDCTP program was launched in 2003. Many of you must know about this. With the overriding mission to build clinical research capacity in Africa, among the several very good things that this program did was investing in research infrastructures. It equipped research laboratories in Africa and had some very functional networks in the region. Research funds provided through the EDCTP program helped to sustain these research laboratories. Unfortunately, with the expiration of the EAD program, one, most of these labs and research groups are dormant as the wait for the, pro for the next program. So the program, the problem is that funding is sparse and far in between. There is no pipeline of funding to sustain research activities. How then can research groups or laboratories in Africa sustain their research activities when funding from a donor phases out? So these challenges raised really are not unique to these initiatives or programs but they are highlighting some of the difficulties in strengthening health research capacity in Africa. All these programs had genuine and good intentions. They probably realized all their primary objectives, but the challenges in strengthening research capacity still persist. As we've gathered here to discuss on the transformation of Africa into a hub for research excellence, we need to think thoroughly on how we intend to go about this. Now, the challenge cited so far actually is snippet of the reality. Allow me then to extensively outline more challenges for the time that I have and how they are hindering research excellence in Africa. Some of these are interrelated. Addressing one or two might really help us. And many of them have been spoken about today, so I really don't mind going into much details about them. But the few that I have, number one, there is little or no alignment between research strengthening efforts and national development agendas. Research is really not a priority in many African countries. Research budgets are in the lowest. There is this declaration about a 2% health budget for research. We heard about 1% this morning. Most health research strengthening efforts are funded by international organizations. These organizations have their own agenda and priorities. Often these priorities do not align with the research agenda of some of the countries. Capacity strengthening efforts, they need to consult with national governments so that research capacity development work can be harmonized with the development of broader national health research systems and innovation systems. Governments will be reticent, maybe, and difficult to dialogue with sometimes. But if we want these initiatives to have the greatest impact, we need to get national governments involved in this way. It will be much easier then for researchers to ask questions and design studies that resonate with national policy and developmental agendas. We heard a lot about Uganda. It might be the exception with South Africa. But Africa has 43 countries, 46 countries, and uh, this applies to those ones. Number two here. There are very few research leaders and few or no solutions to local health problems. Now, we heard a lot about the Ebola crisis, and besides the numerous things uh, that have been revealed, I think two things really stand out for me. The absence of adequate scientific solutions to, to deal with local health issues, and the absence of leadership, including then research leadership. The crisis we've heard about uncovered the frailties of research capacity building efforts. There are still no solutions to many of our local health problems, and even when these solutions exist, access is difficult, implementation is difficult. Most often, research capacity efforts focus on the big three health issues we've heard, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, leaving all the disease burdens, such as neglected diseases and non-communicable diseases, unattended. 
Just recently, we know about what happened in Niger with the meningococcal disease occurring in Niger with about 8,500 suspected cases and so many deaths. Research strengthening efforts, therefore, need to encompass all these health burdens and be suited to respond to health issues. Number three, there is the extremely slow uptake of research results or findings into policy and practice. Most often, research findings or solutions that can have immediate impact on patients' health do not easily get into practice. We generally rely on disseminating the findings in peer-reviewed publications, hoping they will be picked up by policymakers and then be put into practice. We heard this morning the minister talked about chloroquine resistance. We know there were ACTs. How long did it take for us to get to that? We have rapid diagnostic tests for malaria. It's been shown to be very effective. Implementation for this has been very, very slow. We know about the efficacy of uh, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine for IPTP for pregnant women. You look at the coverage in countries, it's just about 20%. And we know that if this were done, you know what kind of results we will get. The reasons then for this slow uptake could be multifactorial, but we need to make sure products and solutions that have been scientifically proven be useful should easily get into practice. Then this leads me to the fourth point, limited support for conducting and communicating research findings. Publish or perish, that is a scientific mantra, and we work very hard towards that. The findings we obtain from our research activities are good to be shared with colleagues via peer-reviewed journals, as we say, scientific conferences. Rarely do we bother about our local clinicians or policy makers. Fortunately, this is an aspect most health research capacity strengthening programs are trying to address. Most programs request dissemination of results locally and strong interaction with public health officials. So we hope this situation will get better. Number five is too much focus then on knowledge generation generation. So much of the research conducted in Africa and by African scientists is on knowledge generation. For example, we talk you know, the prevalence of this and resistance and so on. We generate knowledge, but what is the impact? In many instances also, we are data collectors. We need to be idea generators and come up with our own research agenda that is supported by our governments. African governments should fund research with substantial amounts. I don't know how we can get this to happen. We need to go beyond this culture of knowledge generation and cultivate a culture of innovation. Innovation not only in the development of drugs or vaccines, but also in designing strategies to finance, to engage, and to deliver health interventions to communities. Innovation is not just about new, but also in doing things differently in a more sustainable and effective manner. And the next, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going with my slides, am I? I'm completing this lack of uh, research career opportunities. On completing a PhD, most African researchers are faced with two options. Either they move to a northern institution or are recruited at a local university with primary function to teach. Truly, there are few or no sustainable research career opportunities for young researchers once they complete their PhDs. If we want these young scientists to become the research leaders Africa needs, we have to invest in them, invest in viable research institutions. We need to find a way to retain them after their PhD at our local institutions and provide them with funding opportunities, intensive mentor research experience. Also, an enabling environment, our environment barely encourages or rewards those involved in research. There are few research institutes which often are poorly equipped, even at the universities where research, research should be promoted. The infrastructure is lacking, even when the facilities may exist. Obtaining reagents, as you know, would be extremely difficult. 
supporting mechanisms for mentoring plans to groom young researchers. For those who are involved in research is needed. For those who are involved in research, there are little or no awards and recognition to help motivate researchers for their achievements. Now, talking of mentoring, we just responded to a call from TDR to help young women scientists to develop their career plans. And in this, we've really been able to establish a strong mentorship, mentor protege program. And I know this is really important in most, uh, uh, for most uh, research scientists. There's also uneven geographic coverage of existing and future research capacity strengthening programs. This picture that I have here, I really love sharing it. I talked about it this morning a little bit with uh, Nadia. At present, geographic coverage of research capacity building activities is very uneven, as you can see there. This is just for HIV AIDS, but it's not very different with others. I wrote about this paper in the Lancet on this. There is so much focus on Western, Eastern, and Southern Africa, and practically little or nothing outside Anglophone Africa and Central Africa. Please allow me to quickly, I will conclude by praising the efforts of two new initiatives that have been launched, though it may be quite early to uphold these initiatives in such high esteem. I do firmly believe that these initiatives are coming out to address some of these challenges and in transforming Africa into a hub of research excellence and innovation. I would be especially glad if support can be mobilized to help this initiative. The first one here is the RF. This program is meant to support early career African researchers. What I really like about it is the mentoring and nurturing experience that these early career scientists will benefit from. I hope our young scientists apply to this program. Obviously, they would be retained for the program if funding is available to support. Without any conflict of interest, please support this program in whatever way you can. The second initiative is uh, yeah, the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa, ISA. And I know that uh, Kevin Mash will be here to talk about this, which has, you know, in Nepal, it has the Deltas program, the Brand Challenges for Africa, and uh, engages innovations in Africa to solve the most pressing challenges in global health and development. This is Kevin Stock, and he will be here to talk to tell you about it. Well, now for the traditional funders, may I truly say you are doing a great job helping us in Africa to strengthen capacity. And I'm very happy here to see that UNESCO and Merck are coming together to further this so we can have more research with the institutions, more scientists, and have more networking and people coming together to solve all the problems that we have in health. Research can do a lot in this, and we're counting on you all the funders. So you're doing a great job, those that are there, and for those that are coming in, we welcome you. Thank you very much.